Today's message from last week uh, was taste and see that the Lord is good, but this week it is going to be praise from the cave because of the backdrop of the uh, Psalm 34, which is going to be where we're focusing in the Word primarily. And I had some more time to, you know, to examine the Word, to study it, and I want to apply this Word to the time that we're living in as we go, go through this uh, great Psalm of David. And it's always my goal to apply this stuff to how, where we live and what's transpiring our lives and, and make it relevant. So that's the, that is the goal. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to share the word. We ask blessings upon it. Just open our hearts to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, uh, we took a little bit of time with this, uh, this history, the account of David and his uh, trouble with Saul being pursued by Saul. We're going to kind of abbreviate a little bit so we can get to the psalm. So David uh, is, uh, is an enemy at this point of Saul. Saul has a lot of jealousy towards uh, uh, David. You know, they would sing the songs, Saul has, has killed his thousands, but David is 10,000. Just, just, the jealousy drove Saul a little bit uh, uh, sideways. You know, he just got, he was just outraged. So he's in pursuit of David, and David is on the run. And oddly enough, when David leaves, he forgets his sword. He forgets to take his sword. And he's on his way, and I guess he's in a rush, because out the door he goes, and he winds up heading to the Philistine uh, city of Gath. Now, before he goes there, he sees the priest, Abimelech. And Abimelech says, you don't have a sword, but I have one here, and it's behind the ephod. And he takes out uh, Goliath's sword, right? Now, we don't know what David looked like. He may have been scruffy, may have a beard at this point. He's kind of on the run. And, but he gives him uh, Goliath's sword. And uh, down he goes into Gath. Now, let me just say this. Last week, I was uh, watching a little documentary. And uh, this was a documentary about, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. It'll, it'll come to me. But uh, he went into a, a cave when he was walking in Israel, the Lord spoke to him and he said, the, the Ark of the Covenant is in Jeremiah's cave. And he just, just came to him and he pointed, he said, it's in the cave. Uh, Ron Wyatt, remember Ron Wyatt? And, Ron, and, he's, and he applies for a, a permit to do the excavation and digs down in there. And it's a long story. It's quite an intriguing one. And some people have questioned it. But he said when he went down there, he found... Uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is right below Golgotha's Hill. It's right below it, right directly below it. And that's where they, they believe the priest hid all of the articles from the temple when they were being attacked by the Babylonians during the 536 uh, when they were being taken on their 70-year captivity. And so they hid it down there, and that's where it was. So he, he goes in there, and he finds the tunnel, and he finds a cave, and he finds, in his report... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And the rest of the story is, I'll just throw this in there, they believe that when Jesus was on that cross and the earthquake came, that it cracked the earth right below, it's right below it, that's where I found it, it cracked the earth about 20 feet below, and when the, uh, when the centurion uh, ran the, so the, the spear into Jesus' side, the blood in the water, it's, and that's a medical thing where it separates, flowed out in such volume that it went down this, this crack next to the cross, went down through that crack and wound up right on top of the mercy seat. And when he, when the, when he, when he uh, took this, went down there, he was showing in the Bible it says, when you do the blood in the, of the bulls and the goats, when the, when the priest goes behind the veil, it was always on the eastern side, the, the left side. That's where the bulls and goats, you, you didn't put it on the other side. But when he got down there, the blood that they found on the ark was on the other side. And it was, it's the mercy seat, which represents the Lord. Now, people have questioned this, and you might too. Do the, do the research. You can do a little bit of a search on it. And that blood came down. It would make sense, you know, if you say, say, well, that makes sense. The blood of the lamb, the lamb, on that mercy seat and completes that. So, and in that cave, guess what was in there? The sword of Goliath was in the cave. And he has a, a model of it. And it's 62 inches long. And it's, uh, you know, thing. It's got the thing, things this way where if you're fighting with somebody in a battle, you know, it would hit these uh, pieces that come out. And it was shaped like this and it went like that. It's very interesting. So this is a model of it. So they left it all in there because when they went in there, there were angels in there. 
and uh, that rearranged it and put it in a certain way. And Ron Wyatt says, they put it a certain way. I have no right to do anything with it. I'm going to leave it there. The rest, the rest of that story, six other guys went in there to mess with it, and all six of them died. All six of them died, and they couldn't get him out, so guess who they called? Ron Wyatt, to go in and drag these guys out because he was apparently the one who was authorized to go in by God. That's the story. I'm just saying that's the story he tells, and you can uh, question that if you'd like. But the point is, in the Bible it says that David took this sword of Goliath and he goes down to Gath and there are some people there that see him and they say, that might be David. I mean, he looks a little scruffy, didn't say that in the Bible, but they don't really know it's him, but they think it is and I think it might be, called, be, be because he had what? He had the sword. And they say, that, does, that looks too big for that guy, but he's got that sword. David said, there's none other like it. He, he really admired that sword. So they take him to King Achish, and uh, when he goes there, he acts insane. He does his insane act, and he starts drooling and, and acting odd, and he's writing on the walls, and, and it comes to the king, and the king says, get that guy out of here, don't bring him into my court, and, uh, and he has that, you know, he, he has a, a strategy there, as odd as it may be, and they take him out. So David leaves that... Uh, that Gath, and he goes to the cave at Adulam, or the cave of Adulam. Now, Adulam is a, a city, a town, and there's a huge cave there, and he goes into the cave, and word gets out somehow that David is in that cave. And you can go to that cave today, which is, or let's say the, the cave that's in Adulam, and there's a huge cave there uh, that they suspect might have been the cave. And, and men from around that region start hearing about David being in the cave. First he's alone, and all of a sudden the men are coming into the cave. And uh, eventually they have 400 men in the cave. <clears throat> and it goes on to say, he escaped to the cave at Adulam, and this is, uh, you can watch, look at the information here, or read about it from in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and 22. Uh, and when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down to David. Okay, here's the cave. Here the guys are coming, streaming up. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontent gathered unto him. And, <clears throat> and David became the captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So I'm thinking, okay, this is like the first man cave experience, right? This is man cave stuff going on. Now, we've changed that quite a bit, but it's the man cave. You know, it's a bunch of men in a cave, and you can apply the principles, girls or guys, doesn't matter. But the people that came to him had certain distinctives and struggles in life. This is like when Jesus got the disciples. He said, follow me. Well, they weren't perfect you know, men of God who were like, you know, doing it all. They were, they were a rough crew too, just fishermen and workers and regular folks. And the Lord says, I'm, I'm going to work with this crew here. This is the 400. And, they, and what the men were looking for is one thing. They're looking for a leader. What, what men need is, is a leader. And, you know, the movie that I, that I, I, don't, I haven't watched it probably in many years, I, I refer to it, and that's Mel Gibson, Braveheart. You know, William Wimberford, no, William... Uh, Wallace, I mean, William Wimberforce, he was another guy. W William Wallace, and you know, the, the whole, the whole uh, country is being destroyed and they're being oppressed, and they don't know what to do until they get, until they get Braveheart, you know, and, until William Wallace comes along and he leads these guys, and they become mighty men, mighty warriors. And that's what happens with these guys that David gets a hold of. They become mighty men. And that's our goal next uh, Saturday for the Christian Men's Network. And I think we might call it the Mighty Men. I don't know, we might call it something else. But the Mighty Men Movement. The Mighty Men Movement. And we need guys that are going to be great and mighty men. So, but that you don't start that way. You have to be trained. But you have to be inspired. And they needed David. He was like the key to the whole thing. And, uh, but the, the crowd he's working with here, uh, they're distressed, they're discontent, they're in debt. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of like a lot of guys are today. You know, they're discontent with life. They're distressed. In other words, they're st stressed out. We would say stressed out. You know, they just, it's.
kind of like life is kind of weird now with all the things that have happened in COVID and political unrest and all of the stuff that's going on in the country. And you kind of get out there and then you watch the news, which is not a very wise thing to do, I don't think, uh, watching the news. And then you, that makes you more distressed. I was listening to a guy that I've, uh, on, uh, that I've listened to a lot on uh, uh, YouTube, and he talks about the end times. I'll tell you his name. But he said, just yesterday, I'm watching it. And he said, you know, the Lord was convicting me of this. He was away on a vacation. You know, you go away on a vacation, the Lord speaks to him. And he said, I was, I was fearful and I was distressed. I was full of anxiety because I was filling myself with the, the, the daily 24-hour news cycle. He said, he's watching news, he's watching news. Now, because he's a prophetic guy, right? He's, he wants to do prophetic things. So you're watching this stuff. And he said, I was all out of sorts because he had opened his heart, his mind, his emotions to the world system. And he was, that was flooding in and he was losing his peace. So it can happen to us. So I'm thinking that we've got guys all across this country, in this, in this region, in this state, and, and they're distressed. A lot of them are in debt. You know, debt produces a lot of pressure. The Bible says the, 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 uh, the borrower is a, is a slave to the, to the lender. So the more debt we're in, you know, some kind of, some of it's maybe unavoidable, you know, if you're buying cars and houses and some things. But there's a lot of like consumer debt, people buying every kind of thing out there, and you get in debt, a lot of pressure. Uh, so we have a lot of people that are like that. And, and here's what God wants to do. He, he needs some leadership, that's what we're going to build. We're going to build men who are leaders. That's what we need. We need a William Wallace, but we need some, we need some troops, and that's what's going on. So... When I go to the prison, let's say the prison, the jail, the correctional institute over there, these guys are, they are just thrilled to hear something from heaven. They sit there, they're just uh, sponges. And I'm thinking this is, this is part of, the, of, of, of that training uh, of men. Because I say this over and over, men are the key. If we get great men, powerful men, devoted men, we've got great families. You got great families, you got great churches, you got a great community. That's just how it works. But unfortunately, in our culture today, we do not have as many great men. Matter of fact, the, proportionately, it's the women who are carrying a lot, of the, a lot of the burden because the men are not there and they're not participating. So that's the backdrop. Now we're going to Psalm 34 and see how quickly we can move through this psalm. Lord bless it. Psalm 34. A Psalm of David, if you have a little note over that, when David changed his behavior before Abimelech, that's like a title. The king's name was uh, Achish, Achish, and drove him away and he departed. Now it begins with this. Now look at the picture. David is, uh, this is the, what I believe was happening. David is, was in the cave with the men. Part of it is his watching what was transpiring and what was taking place in his wife. And the other is how he was training his men. Right? There's two things going on here. And it says, it begins with this. I will. Now, that's a decision going on. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, David had just been delivered. He said, I was in trouble. They had me in their grasp, but God delivered me. He said, I'm praising God for that one. David was, as we know, a shepherd, but he was a worshiper. He was that worshiping shepherd over his sheep. And I'm telling you, this is what you have to choose to do. He says, I will, uh, I will worship the Lord. Hebrews 13, 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's, this, is, uh, this is kingdom conduct. You know, this is what happens when you get mighty men. Mighty men uh, praise God loudly. When we had, back in Promise Keepers, you know, that was the big thing. You know, uh, great men praise God and they're loud. They're good praisers. So that's what David is saying. Philippians 4, 4, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say... See, it's rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice evermore. And rejoice. You're praying, but you're rejoicing. That's going to keep you strong in, in your mentally and emotionally because your eye is on the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Now, 
David is dealing with these 400 guys, but they're a rough crowd. But here's what, here's what it says in 1 Corinthians. And this is what Jesus did with his disciples. He said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Think about this. This is how God works. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. See, that's, that's a powerful portion there Paul's writing there. He said, God, he said here's, God, here's the ones that God wants. He wants humble people who are going to be dependent on God, and they're not going around, well, look at how good I am and how wonderful and how high and mighty, and, uh, and uh, it would be God's privilege to kind of get me, you know, to be part of his kingdom. He said, no, uh, you, you, you fail a test. And he's looking for the other one. The thing, that the, the thing that these people need is one thing and only, and that's faith in God. To believe that God can do something that they don't think they can do, but they have faith to believe that God can do it in and through them. That's the 400 guys that are in the cave. God pulled them out and put them in that position. That's my, my feeling on it. And he says this, my, verse 2, and my, and my soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble are going to hear, and they're going to be glad. So here's David saying, I'm boasting in the goodness of God. I'm exalting him. I talk about him. This is what we need to do as men. He said, my boasting is in the Lord, not in me, not in, in what I have done. David's saying it, but it's for us. We don't boast in how good we are, but rather all that God has done in our life and through us. It's our testimony. It's a powerful thing, our testimony. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they love not their life unto death. And he said, I'm going to boast. And you know what? The humble are going to hear that. The proud won't hear it. But the humble are going to say, whoa, that's a, this, guy's, this guy's got something going on with God. And he's not ashamed of it. He's not ashamed. He's uh, boasting in the Lord. And the humble are going to hear it, and they're going to be glad. And we could add to that, they're going to be drawn to the, to the things of God. Verse 3, O oh, magnify the Lord with me. And then he goes into let us, he's talking about now, see it moves a little bit, into the 400. He said, O oh, magnify the Lord and, uh, 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 with me, and let us exalt his name together. So that's what the church is. We come together and we worship God. We, we magnify Him. Now, I've taught you the principle. Whatever you magnify will dominate your life mentally and most of all, emotionally. If you magnify the negative, you become a negative person, but you wind up with a little depression and a little sadness and a despondency. You get a little lukewarmness because you're watching and you are opening your eyes to things and I always go back to the, you know, the bad news. Anything you watch on the news is always negative. I say always, you know, it's metaphorical, but it's hyper hyperbolic is what it is. It, say, it's almost always negative. Whatever you watch on there and you let that stuff in, you magnify it in your life, that will dominate you mentally and emotionally and it'll affect you. That's what that preacher said. He said a big preacher, he got TV and, or on, on this He's got his own website, and people watch that. He said, I was full of fear and anxiety and stress because he kept watching that stuff. But when you magnify the Lord by studying his word and worshiping him, worship tapes, and you and you're got, uh, you got your prayer life in place, you, you're, you emotionally, it, it affects you. You've got now kingdom life, which is righteousness, but it's peace and joy and power of the Holy Ghost. And that's, that's a kingdom man. These guys become David mighty, David's mighty men. Over time, they become mighty men. They're warriors in the Lord, right? So we, we're going to magnify the Lord like a magnifying glass. We make it bigger and more wonderful. The heavens declare His glory. It's like it's wonderful. We magnify Him. And uh, verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord and He heard me. It's a good thing. You're a magnifier. You're one who is connected to God like that. And uh, I, I was seeking the Lord, and he heard me. And he delivered me from my, what? The fears. See, that's what David was struggling with, the fears. He said, but I sought the Lord. He said, I wasn't looking at the problem over here, and uh, Saul chasing me, and I'm down in Gath. He said, I sought the Lord. I was, was kind of toast over here because they captured me, and they thought I was David, didn't know. And, but I sought the Lord, and he delivered me 
primarily, he delivered him out of physical circumstances, but he said he delivered him from, from his fears. You know, in America today, how many people are in fear? They watch all that's going on and all the trouble and nationally, internationally, and all of a sudden it starts to work on you and you have this uh, trepidation. You know, you're just a little bit fearful of something. And he said, you seek the Lord and, uh, and that will change. And verse 5 says, and they looked unto him. And I think he's talking about the 400 here. There's a little shift in there. He said, and they looked unto him and were lightened. That means made radiant. It's a countenance thing. They looked, they looked, they looked to the Lord and their countenance changed. Their faces were not ashamed. I said, see, that's the end time believer. That's the man of God. He's not going to look all down, you know, you just look sad. There's a radiance, there's a countenance that you have that is going to attract people. Just a joy and a, and a brightness. That's what it is, a brightness in, in, in there. That was the, <clears throat> that was the 400. Because I think David was instructing them and they're going, wow, we've got to look to God. and we're, we're, dis we're discontent. We're not happy about anything. You know, every life stinks and... Uh, you know, the people are against us and we're victims and, oh, look at what's happening in, the, in the Saul. He's a bad leader and we don't know what to do and we're distressed. We're all burned out. And David says, you do this. You magnify the Lord. You look to Jesus. You seek God. And when they did, it says they, uh, uh, they were not ashamed now. They're not ashamed anymore. Shame is a terrible thing. Guilt and shame because of your things that you've done in your life, you know, are failings, but the Lord will lift you out of that as we look to Him. It goes on to say, this poor man cried, now not that he was crying, but that means he cried in prayer. He cried out in prayer and the Lord heard him. Now you see that over and over. When we cry to the Lord, God hears us. And uh, he, he heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles. Now that's David. He said, I got delivered out of this thing. Over and over, the Jewish people, it's like they would, whenever they went into battle, whenever they went to the Lord and asked God what they're supposed to do, that, whether win or lose, then uh, they would win if it was God's purpose in their life because they sought the Lord. You know, and James says that. He said, don't say I'm going to go to this city or that city and do this job and that job. You say if the Lord will. You pray about it and ask God what his opinion is. It, and if it is, then you're going to go and you're going to succeed and prosper at it. And that's how we need to live as, uh, as godly people. And I like this. The angel... Oh, let me give you a scripture, though, that connects with this. 2 Corinthians 3.18, one of my favorite verses. You can write it down, but it says this. And all of us, as with an open or an unveiled face... See, when we get saved, the veil goes away. The, it's this veil that's uh, obscuring what life is about. I think that's what it is with a lot of people today. They, they just don't see things as they are. He said, we take the veil away, and, and then, because we continually behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and then are constantly being transfigured into His very own image from glory to glory, in ever-increasing, listen to this, splendor, and from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit of the Lord. He said, we get an unveiled face and then we be continue to behold the Lord. In, in, the, in other words, in the mirror, in the Word of God, we begin to go to the Bible and we're now beholding Him. You say, well, how, do you, how can I see? I want to see the Lord. Open your Bible and read it because He is all through it. Because Jesus, He is the Word became flesh. He and His Word are one. When we read this Word, we see Him. What I do now, I have a ear, I've got ear pod thingies, you know, and I got a, an app, and, uh, and I put the app on, you know what it is? The Bible. I just, uh, faith comes by hearing, and it goes, what it does, it, it skips around the Bible. It'll go, pick one out of this, and pick one out of chapter here, and just let it, I just go through the day, just let it fill it. Just the Word of God. It's like, wow, I've, it, it'll just lift, it's like food to the soul, folks. I'm, or, what I used to do is listen to, uh, you know, to the news programs, to the talk shows. That's depressing. You know, you don't, I mean, you, it's not that you're going to get lost. It's just that you're, you're not going to have the buoyancy and the, and the brightness in your, your countenance. But you let that word just go into your spirit uh, all day long. And it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's just life changing. And so that's what it says. You just, uh, you get that unveiled face. You take that veil off and, it, and it's continually beholding. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking away, Paul writes this, looking away from everything that distracts to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith and the, the beginner, uh, 
and the, the finisher of our faith. And I like Psalm 27, 4. And David is writing this again. Back to David. David says this, one thing. Everybody say, one thing. This one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. And here it is. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To behold to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple, to meditate, to pursue Him, to seek Him in His temple. He said, that's the one thing, behold Him. You know, when I've said many times, what you behold is what you become. What you behold is what you become. If you want to be perverse in your thinking, all you need to do is watch pornography. If you watch it, you become it. If you want to be depressed, watch depressing things. If you want to be a carnal person, read and watch carnal things on a regular basis. What you behold is what you become. When we behold the beauty of the Lord right here, we behold it. We can, we can maybe to a degree when our worship and praise and God gives us a, an open view of heaven and uh, of the king. And uh, uh, <clears throat> then he goes on to say this. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that, what? Fear him. Watch it on the screen. That fear him and delivers them. He delivers them. So Jesus is our deliverer. And the, uh, the angel of the Lord is a, is a phrase used of the, the pre-incarnate Christ, almost exclusively through the Bible. When you say the angel of the Lord did this, it's always about the pre-incarnate Christ. So he's saying he encamps around about those who are walking uh, in fear. of, him. In other words, deep reverence of him. He watches over you. Personally, he is, he's with us, right? And uh, that's what David is teaching. He's teaching the, the 400 this. And, uh, and he delivers them. And he had just been delivered, so that was a great testimony. But these guys needed to hear that. He said, you can be delivered. If you walk in the, in the reverence of God, the deep reverence, the awe, and you, when you relate to God, it's an awe, the awe of God and the greatness of God. And then he says, the word, what we all know, have heard many times, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He's going he's gonna to direct your paths. What a great verse uh, uh, in Proverbs 3.5. He said, you, you just trust him and uh, taste and see. When you say taste and see, that means experience him. When you say taste, it means experience the Lord. You get this thing right in your life and you will find out how wonderfully it works and how you can be delivered from who knows what. And the big thing is fear. Again, the power of life is in our emotions and the, and the bondage of life is the bondage of fear, the bondage of worry, the bondage of anger the bondage of, of remorse, of regret, of jealousy, of shame, of guilt. They're all emotional bondages. The Lord says, I'm going to deliver you out of them, all of them, all of them. And uh, in Luke 4, 18, that's what it says. He's, he's going to, uh, the anointing was, of God was on him and to bind up the brokenhearted. You know, it's all about changing you and delivering you. And then he says, fear, uh, blessed is the man, the trust in the Lord, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for this there is no want to them that... It's the same thing, that have awe of God. And, and the promise is this, as we walk in the, in the reverence, in the awe of God, he's going to make a way for us. If you put your trust in the world, you put your trust in the government, you put the trust even in your job, that, no, 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 thank you, I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. And when you do, he will make a way for you. He'll open a door that no man can shut. That's what he does for those who, who walk in the fear of the Lord. Then this little portion here about the young lions, they lack and hunger, and they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. A little bit of uncertainty. The young lions, it's like little baby lions are always hungry, but they never get enough. Kind of like that's how a lot of people are. They're hungry, they never get enough. But he said, no, if you walk in the fear of the Lord... If you seek him, you're not going to want any good thing. He's going to take care of you. And uh, Hebrews 11.6 says this, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
You, want to, you say we want to walk in the reward of God, not out of, a, not out of a, a, a selfishness, but out of a purity of heart. You say, you're just going to be a seeker of God. That's, what, they say, that's, my, that's my mandate of life. I'm going to seek Him and glorify Him. And when that's, that's your passion, He said, then God's going to reward you. And it'll come in ways that will surprise you. It'll say, say, wow, look at what happened there. Look at what happened there. And I, he delivered me out of this. And your life begins to change. And you get that radiant glow on you, that funny little smile that the other people don't have. You know, you just got that grin on your face. And they'll say to you, you know why you got the what you're grinning about? You don't not know how, how bad things are out there? You look at some Christians, they don't have, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm with a lot of them. They don't have, there's no glory or joy in their countenance. There's no uh, radiance. They're missing the radiance. They're all like, hmm. Too serious about things. You know, we got to be serious, but sometimes you look and you say, boy, we need a little bit of more of a, a little more glory glow on the old face there. Amen. Good place to say amen. Amen. That's good. You say, oh, he's talking about me. 11, look at this. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I'm, this is talking to the 400, and I will teach you, guess what? The fear of the Lord. He said, that's the key. That's the key. The fear of the Lord causes a man to depart from sin, or a woman. But for the men, he said, no, you, uh, what you need is the fear of the Lord. Remember old Jim Baker back there, you know, he was, uh, got in some trouble, I told you this many times, and he wrote the book, I've got it on my shelf, and it said, the book about this thick, and it says, I was wrong. Good for him. He said, I was wrong. Good, repent of it. He kind of goofed up there, big time, he goofed up, and he wrote the book, and they asked him, they said, well, at what point did you stop loving God? He said, oh, I never had a problem loving God. He said, what I was missing was the fear of the Lord. He said, I didn't walk in the fear of God. The fear of God causes a man to depart from sin. There are two guide, so guardrails, if I could repeat myself, on the, road, on the narrow road. Broad road, narrow road. Narrow road, guardrails. One of them is the love of God. The other is the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord causes a man to depart from sin. And the love of God, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Simple as that. You can't have more, too much of one, too much of the other. You've got to balance those out. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> For what is man? He's going to teach us. He's teaching them the fear of the Lord. That's a great thing. What man is he that desireth life and loves many days that he may see good? And say, that's like all of us. We all want that in life. We're all seeking those things. He says, then keep thy tongue from evil. This is a James verse, you know, about the tongue. and the, It's the most unruly member. He said, keep your tongue from evil. Watch your mouth. That's what he's saying. And your lips from speaking guile. In other words, deceit. Remember Nathaniel, when Jesus sees Nathaniel, and he said he sees him, he said, a man in whom there is no guile. Now, guile is deceptiveness, a little cutting around the edges of truth, you know, not quite telling the truth. And you're deceptful. It's a manifestation of the flesh. He said, those lips, you always speak the truth. He said, that's how you're going to get good days. Your days are going to go well if you watch your mouth and you, and you speak truth. Then he says this, uh, depart from evil. That's pretty good right there. Just depart from it. And uh, Paul told that to Timothy. He said, flee, flee fornication. He said, just flee that. Don't get in a situation because fornication, it's immorality. He said, just flee it. So here's David being, uh, 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 being very, uh, very blunt about the whole thing. He says, depart from evil, and not only that, but do, do good. So, and then seek peace and pursue it. So three things, depart from evil, seek peace, and, uh, and do good. Seeking peace, that's a, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. There, there's people who are more dividers, you know, they're gossipers, their tongue, and they're starting those fires out there. He said, no, if you're a peacemaker, he said, that's, that's a wonderful calling of God that you intervene and make peace. One of the things I get to do with when I counsel couples is to make peace. And it's, uh, it's challenging, but if you have the wisdom of God, uh, you can do it. Because the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Two things, his eyes... And his ears. The eyes are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. In other words, to their, to their lament, to their needs, to their cry of help. It's like a child saying, I, Daddy, I need you. Mommy, I need you. I'm, I'm troubled here. So when, when, you know, it's like in the animal kingdom. They've got a, 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 a thousand sheep and mothers and everything around. And the one sheep goes, Mah, and that mother knows the voice of that little one there, right? And uh, can find it. 
It says the Lord knows the cry. Because we all have those times in life. Life is hard. And we get to a place and we cry out to the Lord. He said, I, 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 my eye is on you, number one. You need to know that. That's very comforting. You're not out there on your own just uh, on a sea of circumstances with God's not aware of it. He said, no, I'm watching over you and uh, my ears open. I'm waiting for you to just cry out for help. If you don't cry out for help, I can't help you. So you, don't, you need to cry out. He's teaching the men this, right? Remember that. He's teaching the 400 about this stuff. And uh, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Now, there's a lot of evil people in the world. But God is on the scene and he's going to deal with all of the unrighteousness and the men that are causing the chaos in the world. So that applies to us, I think, today. And then it goes on to say the, uh, the righteous pray or cry and the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all their troubles. For the Lord is nigh unto them that are of, now here's the qualifier, uh, who are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Uh, in Psalms it says, a broken and contrite spirit I'll not despise. Now that really speaks of someone, a uh, broken and contrite, contrition talks about repentance. Someone who's come before the Lord and has recognized that they, in their human form, are desperately wicked. And they, and they, they drop before the Lord and they cry out to God. That's a, that's a contrite heart. And that's what draws, them, uh, draws the Lord to them. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. So drawing nigh, have you been drawing nigh to God? Do you feel Him drawing nigh to you? Do you feel the presence of the Lord as you go through life, that Shekinah, the glory? Uh, but He's nigh to them, to these folks, that their heart is just sensitive to the Lord. They're not, they've no longer walk in pride and arrogance. They're, they have contrition and, uh, and a broken heart. Verse 19, many are the affliction, uh, afflictions of the righteous, no big deal. You're going to have persecutions in life. People are going to reject you, talk about you. The list goes on. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now, God is a deliverer. Sometimes deliverance comes in a strange way. You know, some of the martyrs are going to be delivered, but they're going to go in a little different direction. Verse 20, he keepeth all his bones, and not one of them is broken. Now, now, he's talking about those who are being delivered, but this is also a messianic prophecy. Because God will drop a messianic prophecy in the word and it'll apply to, you know, what he's talking about just in general. But it said, it, this is a reference to Jesus, because when he was crucified on the cross and in his life, not one of his bones was broken. Why is that relevant? Because typically, what does that apply to? When the, when the, uh, when the criminals were put on the cross and they would be up there and they wouldn't die fast enough, what would they would do is they would come up with a sledgehammer and they would break their legs. Why is that? Because they would stay alive because of their diaphragm. When they sank down, they couldn't breathe, so they pushed themselves up on the block, as you see on our cross, there's a block there, to push themselves up to extend their life. And that was fine with those guys. They wanted you to suffer as long as you wanted to, uh, as, as they could make you suffer. But eventually, that ah, he's not dead yet. Just, uh, just break their legs. And once you broke their legs, you couldn't push up anymore. And then you'd suffocate. And I said, not with Jesus, because they said, oh, he's already dead. And they plunged the sword into his side, which was another prophecy. Evil shall slay the wicked, eventually. And they that hate the righteous will be desolate. Now here it says, the evil would, will slay the wicked. The thing about sin is this. It has its own built-in judgment. It's built in. When you sin, there's a consequence, and it's bad. There's a judgment that's associated with the sin. And it says, evil shall slay the wicked. When you live in a certain way and you are, you are a wicked person, you find out many of those people, their life ends way before they should have died because of their, of their conduct. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. These people have nothing inside of them, the haters. And there's a lot of them in our culture today. They're haters. And David is saying to these guys, you can't be a hater. You're distressed. You're burned out. You're in debt. The people have oppressed you. The people have done this stuff to you. He said, don't be a hater. Depart from evil. You can't work with God. You can't walk with God. You can't walk with me. If you're going to be a mighty man, you can't be full of fear but, of men, but you've got to have the fear of the Lord. And then he says, you have to, uh, you've got to be contrite and you can't hate people. 
because that will ultimately work against God's program. There's a lot of folks, even they say they're Christians, they've got this animosity, a hatred for what's going on in the culture today, and we have to watch that. And then finally, verse 22, The Lord redeemeth the souls of His servants, and none of them that trust in Him shall be desolate. You won't be empty. Desolation is like emptiness. He said all of those that are God's children that trust in Him, they are going to be filled and glorious and used of God. Finally, I'll just read this one last part. It kind of reaffirms where we began. This was from uh, uh, the magazine by, uh, of Marvin Rosenthal. It's called Zion's Fire. He deals a lot with the end times, and he's the one who built uh, the Holy Land experience down in Florida that was eventually purchased by someone else, but he, he built it. I remember watching the miracles that took place when he bought the land, and he built that down. We've been down there some years back now, but what a wonderful place. And now he writes this, uh, uh, he's in Winter, Winter Haven, Florida down there. And I was just reading this today, or was it yesterday evening. Moses could have rightly been called a lawgiver, a prophet, a statesman, a miracle worker, a general, a judge. But the divine eulogy was simply servant. The New Testament commentary on Moses was that of a faithful servant. It should always be remembered that God is looking not for great preachers, not for educators or missionaries. Instead, the Lord is looking for faithful servants. Ordinary men and women he can mold into vessels of honor fit for the master's use. Then they can become missionaries. Then they become educators and preachers. But first and foremost, he said, I'm looking for faithful men. He said, I can work with that. That's what David had in the cave, faithful men. Amen? All right. Hallelujah. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for this uh, time to share from Psalm 34. Praise from the cave. That's what it was. It was the, the, the 400 men who are being trained to be God's, end, God's army to take on the powers of darkness. You bless each one, Lord, who is here this morning, that they would take this message, even reread, even reread, Lord, this, uh, this great psalm and see how it applies to their life and to the culture that we live in. I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.